Um, so I'm now delighted to introduce uh, Lucy Barrington, who's a paediatric clinical nurse specialist at the Royal Brompton Hospital. It's going to be, thank you very much, Lucy. She's going to be talking to us about the impacts of living with ICC on paediatric patients. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you, Paz. I'm just going to share my screen now. If you could just let me know when you can see it. Um, Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. Can you see that? Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, thank you, Paz, and thank you. I feel very honoured to speak at, um, at, on the Click um, day today. Um, as Paz said, I'm Lucy Barrington. I'm one of the paediatric inherited cardiac conditions nurse specialists, and I work at the Royal Brompton Hospital, and I cover Royal Brompton and Harefield. Um, so today I'm going to do um, a quick talk. I've got about 15 minutes um, talking about essentially living with inherited cardiac conditions and the impact that this has on paediatric patients. Um, so aspects of living with an inherited cardiac condition. So as I'm sure a lot of you are aware on this talk today, and we all know the experiences vary drastically between um, you know, families, depending on the diagnosis, the type of ICC, the phenotype, how severe the phenotype is, as we know there is a spectrum, the age, age of diagnosis, because we see obviously, as you know, from newborn up to 16 years old until they transition, how they present, and also the family history, the context of how they've come about. Have they had any significant family history of sudden death and all that kind of thing? Is there a significant family history? Um, no ICC patient and family experiences are the same at all. Um, it can have a really differing effect on everyday life, depending on family dynamics, setup, psychosocial impact, a lot of factors that come into play. So today I'm, I'm predominantly really going to focus on talking. I'm going to do a case study of a patient who's under our care um, and show just through the case study how the impact that, the, that this diagnosis of an ICC has had on this child and the family and how me as a nurse specialist and our whole team um, as, an, as a nurse specialist um, and obviously the MDT have supported this family um, throughout diagnosis and, and beyond. So Obviously, the nurse specialist role, um, everyone on this talk today will be fully aware of what it is. Um, and it involves lots of different things, not just clinical, but other research audit, all that type of thing, projects. But I'm going to just focus on the clinical input that, that we have generally and that this family also will have that I'll go into more detail um, further down, down the talk. Um, so obviously, we support with new diagnoses. I'll just whistle stop over these, otherwise I could talk about them all day. Um, support, as we know, bereavement support, psychology support, welfare trigger rescue work so symptom recognition how to escalate what to what to um, escalate to and what we need to do early warning scores risk stratification so for sudden cardiac death and hospitalization um, discussing these patients in an mdt forum um, especially those complex complex patients where we can have a multidisciplinary team discussing from all different backgrounds and, and, and training so we can make a plan for patients. Um, we have regular flags meetings for our, um, our patients who have cardiomyopathy that we discuss weekly with the consultants um, and flag things up and make plans um, going forward. Um, we do post-clinic meetings. We run a nurse-led clinic, a video clinic that we have quite a lot of input with our patients that we run once a week um, and we can support them with either a new diagnosis or giving investigation results, um, those that are not so complex um, and also just general support or new referrals. Translating complex results that can include genetic. Um, transition input, so we do this ourselves um, between the ages of 12, obviously the paediatric team due to 16, but we also cover up to 22. We've got a dedicated nurse-led transition clinic that we do once a month and we also do them within our clinics. Um, we do care plans for nursery schools that I'll go through in more detail down the line. We do visits for schools and nurseries and also teaching because a lot of them, of course, they're not medical. They've not heard of these conditions before. Um, 
we do basic life support training um, for parents, families, carers, friends, anyone who will be caring and having, a, you know, a lot of input with with the child. Um, and we actually have a project undergoing at the moment um, where we're trying to develop this service um, and create a, a, a dedicated clinic for this. Lifestyle advice, you know, obviously we refer and liaise with other professionals. Um, family cascade screening, so we can, we obviously take regular family history taking from, from all families families and also relaying the risk and genetic testing and referring, making sure those at risk and first degree family members are referred in. Safeguarding is a big one, of course, um, you know, flagging safeguarding if there's any concerns or if children are not attending their appointments. Palliative care, we do um, involve as well our palliative care team because these are life limiting conditions to optimize, optimize their quality of life. And of course, inpatient work that we do as well when they're first admitted. So um, today I'm going to talk about the case study. Um, this is a lovely little boy who's under our care. He is now four years old um, and he has hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Um, the mum very kindly sent me a couple of pictures that I could use in this talk today. I've taken his name out for obviously confidentiality reasons, um, but this is a current picture, but he actually presented to us in uh, about two years, just over two years ago in March 2020, when he was two years old and he was admitted to his local following a, a query viral infection infection and they noticed he had a systolic murmur on um, investigation and they did an echocardiogram which showed septal hypertrophy and he was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy then um, he was um, they got advice from the paediatric cardiology team at the Royal Brompton and he was discharged home with safety netting information and was referred urgently to our um, cardiomyopathy service at the Brompton um, our paediatric team triage this referral obviously is urgent being a new diagnosis um, and we obviously um, requested tests for him to have the usual echo um, ECG blood test to be seen in our specialist clinic. Um, there, to note, there was no significant family history. Um, on the next slide, there's a family tree um, that shows this, but there's no family history of any inherited arrhythmia or cardiomyopathy or sudden death. He presented to our clinic um, a couple of weeks after triaging the referral and it confirmed the diagnosis on echo that he had actually significant asymmetrical left ventricular hypertrophy with um, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. I haven't written the gradient here, but um, his ECG also showed repolarization changes for LVH and also left atrial enlargement. Um, blood cardiomyopathy blood screenings were taken, but also we took genetic testing to do for um, HCM panel um, to try and see if we could find the cause. At the time of his appointment, there was some slight suspicion that this could potentially be a rhizopathy, like a Noonan's, because um, on examination with the consultant, they did notice a couple of features. Um, and also for him to present this young with quite a significant um, uh, uh, phenotype, sorry, of HCM is not not so common unless there's there's a sort of mitochondrial resopathy um, or a genetic cause. Um, so he had a cons consultant review and obviously CNS input as actually myself during this appointment when he presented. He was asymptomatic, but he was actually commenced on a beta blocker on bisoprolol as per the cardiologist preference. Um, it is within sort of the general guidelines on uh, the European Society of Cardiology that, that um, symptomatic HCM patients should be put on beta blockers. Um, of course, with, with him being two years old, it's very difficult to know. He can't communicate whether he's symptomatic. Um, we rely heavily on parents, um, you know, um, telling us about concerns, but they thought he was fine. But we put him on a beta block as per the cardiologist felt more comfortable doing that due to the increased risk of, of, of arrhythmias with this. He had close follow-up um, and we were going to see him in six weeks time with an urgent appointment in the paediatric day case for him to be started on bisoprolol because they like to, to have the, the children go into day case to start this medication for monitoring. Of course, they during this was a very difficult appointment um, confirming this diagnosis because the parents at the local were told that there was something, you know, they, they, they said, oh, we were told that, you know, his heart looked a bit thick, but they didn't actually, they didn't know what the actual condition was. And also getting a confirmation from our specialist team was obviously an incredibly difficult thing to take um, when they, you know, they said, oh, he's well, you know, we've never had any concerns. So this is where we come into play in terms of supporting and I, uh, you know, supported them 
signposted them to information, talked to them about what this, what hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is and with obstruction, why he needs to start the beta blockers and also the need for, for, for family screening. Um, also safety netting. So before he went home, just clearly going through all of the symptoms that, 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 that parents need to be aware of and how they could look out for cues of him potentially being symptomatic, because as I said, he can't communicate these. But is he becoming a bit more breathless? Is he becoming more tired? Um, th those kind of things. And they always said he was very active. Is he becoming less active? Um, so this is just, sorry, moving on in terms of the family tree. Um, so they are non-consanguinous parents um, and he actually is one of a twin, a non-identical twin and a, a sister and another older sister who were well, according to family. Um, they didn't have any concerns about them. The mum just had one ectopic pre pregnancy in the past, but was fine. And the dad just some slight raised blood pressure. Um, they were well and, and fine. There was no significant uh, family history of any kind of ICC in the family. There was a heart attack in, in a distant re relative, but it was due to an, an unknown cause. So input from the nurse specialist team. So as I said, safety netting and education, safety netting in regards to um, the symptoms um, and investigations we need to do, also education with the family, community input, family support, making sure that the, the parents and the siblings uh, are referred in for screening and also ongoing management and the impact that this has on the family going forward and for the rest of his, his life. So safety netting and education, as I said, I organised for the for the parents to have basic life support training, um, which they they had when they came back to their next appointment, which we, we did signposting to resources, um, some examples, Cardiomorphy UK and the British Heart Foundation. Um, I had to obviously we discussed the, the education explanation sort of on the need for familial screening, which was the parents did find quite difficult because they, you know, knowing that actually their son has this diagnosis, but of course now they need to factor in the other family members, like their two other children and themselves. Could they potentially have it? Or to the parents, did they pass this on to to to, to the child? So that was also what needed to be organised. And the red flag symptoms. So on the next slide, I'll show we create a traffic light symptom tracker that parents can use and um, they can know what symptoms to look out for. It's individualised and how to escalate. Education on the bisoprolol, why he needs to start this and what it does. Um, the importance of healthy diet and also hydration, talking about the importance of drinking a good amount of fluid with his um, severe HCM diagnosis as well, especially with if he becomes unwell ever um, keeping you know a good fluid intake. Exercise advice and restrictions. This was difficult with him being a two year old. Obviously, he's now four. He's a bit, bit older. Um, it's hard to restrict a toddler running around, but talking about the kind of things, preparing them for the future and telling them, you know, that he's not going to be able to play club, club level sports. He cannot pursue a career in sports. You know, he won't be able to go into the army or, you know, these are all the sort of restrictions. Also, he was at in nursery at the time, so um, liaising with them, um, communicating with the nursery and also um, teaching them. So I provided an online teaching session. It was in the middle of COVID, so I wasn't able to go in and provide provided them teaching on what HCM is because they hadn't heard of it before. Um, and also an individualised care plan that they could have. Um, the nursery did not have an automated external defibrillator and obviously with hearing me say that there is a risk of arrhythmic risk and potential cardiac arrest that obviously concerned them and they were keen to get an AED for the nursery. Um, so they did manage to get one funded from SADS UK and I did signpost them to SADS UK and St John's Ambulance. We always say it's personal preference, they don't have to have one, but most of the time they feel a lot more comfortable having one there. Traffic light symptom tracker. So this is what I talked about that is an individual individualized um, for each patient and it is identifying it's got their their details in there their diagnosis also I like to write a little bit about what the diagnosis is briefly it includes our team details their GP and also the um, what to do with the present a &E to get advice from the on-call registrar this on here um, is essentially just an escalation of, of, of symptoms and how what they need to do and how to escalate. Um, a few members in our team quite a few years ago did a project on this and got some feedback from families and they found it really 
quite reassuring having this and eased anxieties and useful to have as sort of a safety netting um, and I always advise that they keep it on their fridge or have it at home and they take it out with them um, and anyone who's caring for them a family member to, to have have this to hand to. Um, this is just an example of the care plans that we provide for for our patients. Um, we do them for nurseries, for schools um, and also when they go to college um, and even universities when they when they're an adult with the adult CNSs will do. Um, and it's an individualized care plan that obviously details his condition um, and the symptoms that they need to be aware of. And I put in here cues that they could pick up because he was so young. You know, a lot of their questions were how are we going to know? And they're just some things that could trigger that oh he's not quite right um, and also the medication he's on and daily activities one of the main questions that the nursery asked me is what exercise and activities can he do how should he be restricted so having that written down is really helpful for them as well to refer to and also emergency treatment obviously this is quite generic across what needs to be done but um just having it down for them is helpful. We always recommend that the, the school or nursery and the parents let us know to update these regularly because obviously it can change depending on the child's clinical status, their phenotype, and if they have any change in their treatment, then we need to make, make sure it's updated. So uh, can community ask you Hi, sorry. for like, yeah. um, maybe a minute more and then we should, should wrap up. And oh, sorry. Yes, yes, I'm running over. I, I'm nearly done. Yeah, thank you. Um, so community input and family support. So he was referred to the community nursing team, which we do for all children who are diagnosed with a cardiomyopathy, just for, for observation in the community. And it also gives family a bit of support knowing that someone's coming in. He was referred to a local paediatrician so that they're aware of him. Of course, he was diagnosed right in the middle of the COVID pandemic, which is an added stress and anxiety and concern for the family. So having support, a lot of telephone work, referral to support groups. And I did refer them to psychology, which we do offer to all families with this new diagnosis. They declined at the time. Um, they also, the mum did attend with the child a few times, our virtual um, parent and child cardiomyopathy coffee mornings that used to be face to face. But during the pandemic, we changed to virtual, which had been really well received to have that sort of network. Um, and this is some feedback that, that, that we got from from there. Um, sorry, one more minute. Um, a family screening. Essentially, um, he the genetic testing came back that he had a de novo variant in the MYH7 gene. Um, this was then um, obviously communicated to parents and it was advised that predictive testing was extended to his sisters and parents. It actually came back negative, um, which was of course quite a relief for parents knowing that they don't they, they are not at risk and their other children are not um, and they could focus on their child of course as we know this has implications for his future with having a genetic variant in terms of family planning when he's older so this is the last slide ongoing management and impact so of course he's going to have lifelong follow-up we see him regularly in about four to six monthly in our clinic the impact on school and also they travel far they live in Essex so they come to London careful risk stratification so we do annual ECG halters and obviously investigations he is too young to have an MRI scan but that is something he will definitely need once he is old enough um, to assess any fibrosis and also to have obviously a bit more accurate dimensions of his hypertrophy and outflow tract gradient. Obviously the risk of sudden cardiac death, the family are living know it, with knowing that there is a risk. It's not high from his point of view, it's hard to stratify but he's not had any recorded arrhythmias or syncope but that's not to say it won't happen in the future. Uh, future pregnancies for mother obviously you know it's de novo variant but it's very difficult to say um, due to obviously germany mosaism. Um, regular input of our team, traveling abroad, um, also liaising with school, he's just started school so the mum was quite worried about that so you know having input with the school, changing his care plan and speaking with them um, and also his future so career choices coming to terms with his diagnosis he's still only four years old what the future holds for him he'll have transition input um, and future therapies is he going to need uh, ICD in the future? Is he going to need additional medications? Would he need more invasive therapies that may potentially like a myectomy? Is he going to need additional um, medications? So these are all uh, things to live with um, and essentially that's it. I'm so sorry I've run over slightly um, but thank you very much. This is another picture of, of the little boy. I thought it was nice and this is my email if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much Lucy. That was just a fantastic overview and um, a really detailed 
I guess it's all a really detailed understanding Thank of you. how much you and the service provide and how invaluable it is. And so I really look forward to asking you lots of questions about it um, a bit later.